All right, here it is a Monday, September 6th. It is a holiday Monday. It is Labor Day weekend, the anniversary of the hit and run when the woman ran me over on my Harley Davidson and left me on the highway. But I'm still here. I'm kicking it alive and well, healthy. I hope you guys are doing good. Great guest today. You know I always like to, uh, you know, venture off into different types of guests. And today is a fantastic guest. My guest is Vinny D'Agostino, who was a former FBI agent. He was uh, part of the investigation team that went after the old Dread Pirate Roberts on the Silk Road, the dark web, so to speak. He's also a Bitcoin enthusiast, to say the uh, least, and he uh, was part of the the team that went after the Colombo family, Little Mafia, all kinds of stuff now. He's a comedian. Interesting guest, crazy stories. I want to give a big shout out to my good friend Club Soda Kenny for getting this uh, guest for me. You guys are going to love this episode, which is brought to you by... CBD Lion. I've had some serious anxiety lately, and CBD Lion has been helping me, thank God. Oh, man, sometimes my brain can get cooking with anxiety. CBD Lion, I use the tinctures, drops under my tongue, helps me out, helps me sleep, uh, relieves a little bit of that anxiety, and also I use the topical lotions for my messed up neck from that motorcycle crash so cbd line has been helping me for a few years now get through the day i love it clean organic third-party tested cbd cbdlion.com use the code dean for 20 percent off fantastic company great great family actually it looks like if you go there right now you can get 35 percent off One day left for this deal, Labor Day sale. I'm just looking at the website right now, 35% off. And uh, damn, that's a great deal. Anyway, tell them I sent you, cbdlion.com. They also got a new rewards program. The more you buy, you get points and you get some free stuff. Great. They got pet tinctures and pet treats in case you got a dog that's a little cuckoo cbdlion.com what else is going on tour dates lots of tour dates coming up deandelray.com for all your tour dates everybody's like when you come in here or there it's pretty easy you just go to the website and you can find out when i'm going to be in your area next weekend uh what is that september 10 11 12 la jolla comedy store october 1st going to be out there at red rocks with bill burr October 9th, San Jose area at the Treehouse. Teehees, Des Moines, Iowa, October 22, 23. Going to spend a week in Las Vegas at the Comedy Cellar, October 25th through Halloween. Bend, Oregon. I am headlining the Volcanic Theater Pub, November 11th, and Portland, Oregon, Bossa Nova Ballroom, November 12th. And my boy, uh, Shaylin McDonough will be on those shows with me. And there's tons of merch on the new merch page on DeanDelRay.com. Merch galore. Got some Dark Fonzie stuff. Got some Gertie hoodies. All kinds of great stuff. And one more thing. Patreon.com slash DeanDelRay for all your Let There Be Talk bonus episodes. 111. About to put another one up. So 112. Dean Del Rey is on Patreon. That is me. Support the Cactus Radio Network, my podcast network, by joining my Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. CactusRadioNetwork.com is the network for all my podcasts. At Home with Byron Katie, Dark Fonzie, The Grail, and Let There Be Talk. I love all you guys, and I cannot thank you enough for the support. Let's keep rocking out there. Dig this episode. You've had questions about Bitcoin. I have Bitcoin, Bitcoin. I actually haven't heard about Bitcoin in a while. And I was wondering, did it fade off or what? But 
Uh, my, my guest Vinny has all the answers on Bitcoin and all kinds of crazy stuff out there. Stay safe, people. Keep rocking. Here he is, Vinny D'Agostino. All right, here we are. Another episode of After We Talk. Introduce yourself, my man. Sure, uh, Vinny D'Agostino. Uh, dialing in here from New York. How are you? Are you wearing a Bitcoin shirt? It's a, technically a HODL shirt, but the O is the Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Are you into crypto? Well, I, I got to tell you something. Crypto kind of hit. I don't know how old it is, but I've been doing comedy going on 11 years now. And I think it kind of hit right around then. People were talking about it and I wasn't paying any attention to anything except doing stand up. So I didn't know about the dark web. I didn't know about the Silk Highway or crypto <laughs> or any of that yeah, shit. Yeah. I was like, how can I punch this joke up? And I think I started hearing about it just from being at the comedy clubs and people doing bits about it and stuff. And then yeah. I, I dug into it. But, you know, I'm on the Internet 24 seven like a lunatic, yep. but just didn't know at the time that there was this underworld and um, a place where you could just find any, anything, the dark highway. Yeah. The dark web. Yeah. No, it's funny. You said uh, 11 years ago, you're spot on. So that's when Bitcoin was actually invented. Uh, no one knows who the creator is, which makes me think that you're the creator. Because yeah. he's like, you, you nailed it exactly to the, to the year. So 2011 is right around the, the, the time uh, the white paper was released. And so, yeah, it, it takes, uh, it's been around for, for, in terms of crypto, it's been around forever, uh, but it's something that it's been interesting for me because I got into it very, very early on because the cases we were investigating involved it. So, of course, you have to learn about it to figure out how it's being used and, you know, how are people or why are people selling, you know, actual drugs, tangible things for, for you know, uh, what seemed like at the time, just, you know, vaporware, imaginary code until, until I started learning about it and then once I learned about it, I was kind of blown away. And so hearing it from comics and from, you know, my my plumber was at my house uh, a few years ago and I had some Bitcoin miners in my basement at the time. And he's like, is this that Bitcoin stuff? And I was blown away. I'm like, you're the fact that you're asking me, my plumber's asking me about it is awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about it. First of all, are you a former FBI agent or are you still with the FBI? Yep. Former. I left in uh, 2015. And why would you leave the FBI? I mean, you look like a young guy still. Um, no, I, I think it was time. It was something that um, I never thought I was going to leave. It was my, it was one of my dream kind of professions, but uh, as the world changed and as things were changing in cyber, there were opportunities kind of coming up and I had to weigh um, I had to weigh those against with what I had accomplished. And, and I was so lucky that, that when I looked at the things I would, was able to participate in at the FBI, if you, if you were to put up a checklist and you say, I'm going into the FBI, these are the things I want to do. I want to, I want to work Italian organized crime. I want to do a big, uh, takedown. I want to do trials. I want to work, you know, sources. I want to work low level sources and high level sources. I want to do body recoveries. When you think of those things. And when I started thinking about them, I had like a 30 year career condensed into 11 and I'm like, it's only a matter of time till I get shot in the face and everyone's wondering, why didn't he just leave a few years ago? And I had this phenomenal opportunity. My kids teeth are coming in all fucked up and they needed braces. And I'm like, I, I, you know, I kind of felt like it was the time my, my wife's a, my wife's in public service. She's a lifelong prosecutor. And I'm looking at her, like one of us has to go do something to make more money. And, uh, so I drew the short straw, I guess, in that regard, but I was, I, it was the right time. So, let me let me ask you, how do you get into the FBI? Uh, do you go to police academy or do they have their own academy like the CIA, the FBI and the police? How do you get into a specialized uh, department of the FBI? Yeah. So, you know, very different than uh, all the other law enforcement agencies. The FBI has their own academy. It's on Quantico. Have you ever seen like uh, Silence of the Lamb? Oh, yeah. Right. So that's actually filmed in Quantico. So. Uh, I remember watching Silence of the Lambs in the movie theater at Quantico. That's there's a scene where they're in the movie theater doing graduation. Very surreal. You're in Quantico watching a movie on a screen of the of the of the actual theater you're in. But um, it's a, it's just a, it's it's a different process than local law enforcement. So they have their own academy out there so they can really train you slash indoctrinate you into into what it is. 
Um, you nowadays you do it a little bit differently. You you can actually uh, pull down most of the applications online. It's just a it's just a um, very lengthy process. Like some people that I was in class with were waiting five, six, seven years to get a class date to get in because it's just hyper competitive. Wow, there's that many people wanting to get into the FBI. Oh yeah, there was some number they told us was like ten thousand applicants per seat. When wow, you're there. and they spend about at the time this is 2004 they spend. Uh, a little over a quarter of a million just to get you through the background process to get you in Quantico. So you got to, they got to do a background on you. They got to do a po- polygraph examination. I mean, they talk to your neighbors. They talk to like my old employers. Uh, imagine, imagine thinking all the shitty, stupid things you did from 17 and up that some guy's going to knock on a door and be like, Hey, did you know Vinny D'Agostino? And they're like, yeah, I used to throw rocks at my house. You know, uh, <laughs> um, all those on each guy on each guy, they go that deep. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then what's cool in New York, when you make it through, you have to your first um, squad that you land on is I think it was like a one, the applicant squad. So you get to work now the background checks on the new applicants, which is a great way to to slowly work your way into being an FBI agent. Um, and then what's cool about that is so you get these applicants. And it's not like you have the final say, but you have certain leads you have to cover. So you could have a guy from L.A. applying, but he used to live in New York. So they'll send out agents in New York to go knock on doors in Levittown to to ask about Dean uh, and then write up the the, you know, the 302s, the documents to say, yeah, he was an asshole. He was a thief. He was a good guy. He was a bad neighbor. He was suspicious. He was selling drugs from the house. So all these people apply. And it's hysterical because uh, you could see it when you're working the their background how full of shit a lot of the applicants are. And it's, you could take little bets with your friends and colleagues like, Oh, this guy's, this guy's never getting past the background or this guy's going to get up to the polygraph, but we're going to watch his polygraph. Cause it's going to be just, you know, down in flames, uh, polygraph examinations. And that, and that's where it's awesome because they have all this background that takes about six months to a year to do a background check. And then you sit with a polygrapher in a room and we got to sit on the other side of that glass and watch them fall to pieces especially New York polygraphers were, were notoriously difficult. So you have people confessing to crimes. I mean, yeah, crazy stuff that comes out. Now, the FBI, what do they specialize in? Uh, because you got police, criminal, and you have homicide. And then what is the FBI? Every, FBI does every federal violation. So um, any every and any federal law um, the things that other federal agencies will pick up that they'll do a little bit more intensively, even though the FBI covers it, like DEA, of course, focuses on drugs. Secret Service will focus mostly on uh, protection details and credit card fraud, things like that, treasury related uh, stuff. Um, you know, you have the IRS focusing on taxes. The FBI CIA? Actually, What's CIA? CIA is not allowed to investigate anything um, it, within the, the United States. So CIA's jurisdiction their their uh, mission is related to surveillance of overseas people. They're not allowed to do uh, anything in the United States. They have no authority to actually invest, investigate a U.S. person for good reason. Um, they're not allowed to do that. There is some cooperation, but it, it's not like uh, it's not like in the movies, uh, you know, right? Like not not like that at all. But so so on on the FBI, you'll, you could land on an Italian organized crime squad. You can land on a white collar crime squad, a healthcare fraud squad. You know, Ukrainian uh, organized crime, Albanian. Um, I mean, you name it. Cyber, of course, became a started out as nothing. I mean, cyber was like fucking bootleg DVDs, and and uh, and 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 then it's turned into this monster violation that you can imagine. Every single, can you imagine a white collar criminal case that didn't have a cyber component, meaning somebody using a computer to facilitate the white collar fraud? It's impossible. It's it touches everything. Right. Right. So you get in, what was your goal? Like, did you watch old Godfather films growing up or Goodfellas and be like, uh, I want to, I want to go after those guys or what? Because that was really the, the blunt of the crime attraction of FBI until the cyber stuff happened. Right. Yeah. For, for me, it was, and I don't know about, I mean, from what you're, understanding of the FBI is, I mean, imagine going there, what are the types of things you would want to work? And I th- I would think that for most people, organized crime, especially Italian organized crime would probably be in the top three or four for most, for most people. Well, I mean, uh, you know, growing up, who's not obsessed with the, you right? know, the, the, you know, 
starting from the Godfather. I, I, I mean, you know, look, the mob is there is an attraction of the mob of the of the you know the bonding and the click and the family, not just the culture. It's it's something that people that it doesn't exist anymore where we're brothers and, and this is our thing, you know, it's just a different world now. I mean, especially in the rat world, everybody just rats now, but back in the day, you just did not rat. You just did your time. And that was the thing, you know? Yeah. And I think that's for, for me, the fascination. So I'm, I'm first generation Italian. So I think, um, you know, when my parents came here, when they were like 17, 18, they landed in Brooklyn. And then, you know, as I got older, I kind of, you, you, you become aware of it. I remember na- my neighbors would tease. Like, so we moved further out in Eastern Long Island at some point, in part because all the bullshit going on in Brooklyn, like my dad wanted nothing to do with it, but it was very difficult back then. It was difficult even when I investigated and I could explain why, why I say that. But if you run certain types of businesses, you're going to brush up against organized crime, um, especially cash businesses. And so uh, back then, especially back then, you're talking about in the early 70s, you know, there, there wasn't a lot you can do. And uh, law enforcement was largely helpless to protect citizens. So you had these people who were being shaken down by mobsters and they'd rather just pay the mobsters than risk what the repercussions would be. But when we moved further out, when my parents moved further out east to start having kids, you know, you start getting like your, your balls busted by neighbors and stuff. They would say things about like, are you in the mafia? You know, you're like, what is that even? I don't even know. What, I didn't even know what that was really till I got, got a little bit, a little just, bit older. Just blatant racism. You know, yeah, yeah. Italian guy, black it, guys are in gangs. Italian yeah. guys are in the mafia. Yeah. You know, I remember my dad at IBM guy saying that to him. You want to talk about culture and a desire to assimilate, you know, and, and, you know, that's a whole other discussion. But, you know, I remember going to work with my dad at IBM and guys in the office joking around that, oh, we got to do this for Vinny because, you know, he's going to have us whacked and, you know, blatant, you know, which which, again, though, it's part of the Italian culture is to really let it over, roll off your back. I mean. Super Mario couldn't exist in a world unless it was about Italians. But anyway, I digress. But, but so so I became fascinated with it earlier on, probably around, you know, 13, 14, when you really start to understand what it is and um, how Italians play a role in it. And then you have these Italians on the one side that abhor it and hate it. And then you have these Italians on the other that really embrace it. And you could see the different paths that they took. And so I knew that once I got there, that's really what I wanted to focus on if I could. But that doesn't mean I was going to get it. Um, there was a lot of maneuvering I had to do to not end up on a cyber squad, which is really one of the bigger reasons they pulled me into the FBI was for my cyber background. Were you a computer kid? Like, uh, yeah, I yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I was heavy into computers. Like I said, my dad was at IBM for 30 years. So he was bringing home computers in the eighties. Like people were like, what is that? I'm like, it's a computer. They're like, what does it do? I'm like, ah, oh, it's going to be a long conversation, but yeah. these <laughs> monster 200 pound beasts, you know, monochrome monitors dual floppy drives, no hard drives. I mean, that's how early I was introduced to it. So I was doing that almost as a hobby my whole life. Um, When I got to college, I continued to do it at Penn State. I was uh, working, building like labs for the professors and repairing their computers just for money. And then when I left college, I went to law school. And at law school, I was maintaining like law firm networks, again, just because I loved it. But when I applied to the FBI, the list is so long to get in that I learned from talking to the people at the FBI that they said, well, wait a minute, let's add up all your work experience, your time at IBM, your time at at building computers in college, your time doing this now. And it actually qualified as a separate discipline. So I came in under law and cyber, which put me to the top of the pile. Um, And uh, so when I got in, they're supposed to take you and put you over like cyber. That's what they really needed. This was 2004, post 9-11. They needed people working cyber, but the violation, in my opinion, was so immature. Like I didn't want to work bootleg DVD, and 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 it's not to minimize what, minimize what they were doing, but that's the reality. Of it. So I I just denied all the cyber stuff when they came around and asked me. I was like, they have my files and stuff; they can check. So I would just kind of minimize it, and I started volunteer volunteering on these organized crime squads. And then when the draft came around, they pulled me over to organized crime, which was awesome. It was a, it was a dream. I mean, I, I look at it as. The the hold that the mob had, the families in the 70s and 80s, up to John Gotti and the, uh, you know, the the shooting in front of the steakhouse and stuff. That's got to be one of the most incredible stories of America. 
And no one gets tired of a good mob movie. (laughs) And I think to me, it's more fascinating on how there's not that many people. What is it? Five families or whatever. And they had a hold on the entire New York, New York and the tri-state area. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on, man. That shit is that's bigger than anything that's ever went down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's epic. I mean, when you think about it, you have a group of immigrants coming here um, and deciding for themselves that they're going to create an environment where they can provide protection and insulate these communities from other crime. Right. There was a the upside of that was, you know, no one fucked with these neighborhoods. No one fucked with these people they were there to be fucked with from the mob, right? From organized crime, from the five families. But they were like, well, we're going to protect you from gangs. We're going to protect you from people doing this. If somebody comes in and is is bothering you you and your business, you could go to those wise guys, whoever your, your, your priest was, as the expression was, whoever had their arm around you, you could go and say, hey, so-and-so owes me money, right? I bought, you know, uh, they bought 3,000 3, pounds of coal and they never paid me for it you'll know that someone's going to go over there and crack his head open and get your money. So there was a, there was a little, there was a little uh, economy that they built based on this in the really, really early days of, 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 um, of America really. Um, And so to see how big it got and then how monstrously and how epic the collapse of it was. And a lot of it's what you're saying about the cooperation. That was no small thing. That wasn't like overnight people said, we're just going to start cooperating. That's because um, the FBI really began to figure out how to break the back of the uh, mafia. And it wasn't from the outside in, it was from the inside out. Um, I've been, I've been watching. So I made it through doing all that stuff and never really watched the Sopranos. I don't know if you've, oh. seen, but you've seen it, right? Oh, so, of course. So just recently I've seen bits of pieces. I know how it ends. So no one has to worry about ruining the ending, but I just, I don't know. I never got around to watching more than an episode here or there. And so I started watching it straight through in the last, you know, couple of couple of months. And I love it. Phenomenal show. It's probably the most accurate depiction of the the wise guys um, that 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 out of any movie or TV show, really, it's probably the most accurate depiction where they totally shit the bed is the FBI agents handling of um, their sources. It's brutal. Like if you remember uh, you know, big pussy or uh, I'm just at the part where Adriana is being twisted. Right. You know, I want to I want to jump through the screen, uh, you know, and and re- and punch that agent in the face. The whole idea that you could go in and get a source to trust you with their life and treat them like shit. Yeah, it is so ridiculous. It's the way the it's the way it was before the FBI figured this stuff out. And it's why no one wanted to cooperate because they're like, why would I want to put my life in your hands? You hate my fucking guts. Instead, there's so much effort and energy put in, put into identifying who the people are that you can flip. Not just because you might have charges, but who are the people that maybe have done time and you know from other conversations have no interest in going back. Maybe they did 20 years, but that was before they had kids. Now they have kids. That's a totally different ball game. Maybe their wife's going through some health problems, the idea of them leaving. And it sounds fucked up, but you're looking for any angle you can get so that when you approach this person and you say, hey, I'm under no illusion about what I'm asking you. It's horrible. And it's I used to tell people it's the exact same thing. I said, you're going to go pitch somebody. Imagine what they would have to say to you to convince you to cooperate against the FBI. Right. That's, that, that's what you're asking them to do. Oh, it's easy. I mean, these guys are, are, are scumbags and murderers. No, no, no. They grew up with these people. These are their friends. They've known them for 40 years. And you're going to go in and say, hey, it's against the law what they're doing. And you got to help Team America. That's not what they're interested in. You got to find another way, another way into that conversation. And then when you do, um, and this is what I was on the Colombo squad. This is what I really think that our squad did so well during the during the eight years that I was on that squad was identifying these people and then finding a way to develop a re- relationship with them, rapport with them, so that when it came time, they might not want to cooperate right away, but when something ended up happening, they would find a way to reach back out to you maybe a year or two later and say, hey, can we finish that conversation? And then you can go walking and say, yeah, we're ready. We're ready to talk. What, what's the issue? What, what, what is it? Next thing you know, this person's you know, wiring up um, and making phenomenal tape, which is so essential because the jury's jurors I had did not want to believe anything if, unless it was on tape. It needed to be on tape. You know, they don't they're not going to believe a source 
nor would I, frankly, yeah. right? A guy who's who's a murderer himself. Yeah. Uh, but they're they're going to believe it when there's a tape of of the of the defendants talking about killing somebody. They're going to believe that's in their own words unless they believe some conspiracy that we made the tape. You know, it's funny. I I had met um, I I'd met David Chase. You know, actually, it wasn't David Chase. It was the guy that wrote um, Million Dollar Baby. Fuck, forget his forget his name right now. But I had wrote a script about this is pre uh, Sons of Anarchy about a uh, it was called Fresno and it was about a, a, a just three different types of gangs in Fresno <clears throat> and the guy read it. I wish I could remember his name right now, but he said, you know why this doesn't work? And I said, why? And he goes, because your guys are just murdering the whole time. <laughs> right. so yeah. We don't love them. Tony Soprano. Yes. We don't see this fucker murder until way deep yeah. into the show. When he strangles the dude in the trailer, trailer. while Meadows looking at a fucking college. college yeah. And he said, by then you're so invested in this guy. You're like, well, you, you know, so if you saying like, you know, well, those are our friends. I know they you know, murder and, and do, you know, crazy shit. But, you know, he also hooked us up with some illegal cable. He helped Jimmy when his car crashed yeah. and. So it was one of the most eye opening things in script writing that I had ever heard, because I was like, you know, I'm I'm coming off a of dirty, hairy, you know, we blast on yeah. everyone, you know, and, and, and all that shit. So, uh, yeah, that is that's uh, funny to hear. It, it's so true, right? Because I I'm I'm 43. So I grew up, uh, you know, watching a lot of movies with what we would call like two dimensional characters, right? Like. You know, uh, I was just watching Commando. I probably watch it once a year. Probably one of my favorite like '80s kind of movies. Arnold Schwarzenegger—he's just killing everybody. Alyssa Milano, and you, you didn't, as an audience member back then, you didn't need more. Frankly, I don't think I fucking wanted more back then, right? You wanted to go see a bunch of bloodshed. To our credit, and and, and probably because of of the internet, largely audiences have become more sophisticated, or at least portions of the audience seek more when they go see a movie or a TV show. They want to. They don't want to just go and watch a mafia movie where a bunch of wise guys who I don't know much about um, shoot a bunch of people that I don't give a shit about. And I go, wow, that's the mafia. That's not real. Right. So the the people we arrested, um, I always, you know, these are people that in another setting you would have over your house. You'd be hanging out at the bar with. They're very, very charismatic incredibly street smart, incredibly street smart, right? Cunning, like, like, like a, like a, like an animal, like a cunning, like a, like a, like a, like a, a lion is cunning. Like they're, they're predatory, but not in the gang banger way of just identify some weak. I'm just going to punch him in his face and take his wallet in a way to convince that person that he's going to give you his wallet and he's going to think it was his choice to give you his wallet. And that's what's really, really fascinating about it is it is definitely a more of an analogy, analogy, analogous to, you know, a chest and a checkers type of thing. So working sources, it's like I'm given now a piece of the of, of I'm, I'm giving a bishop or maybe just a pawn. But I'm, I'm controlling that pawn. And I'm saying with that pawn giving me full input. Right. It's not like in again, in the Sopranos, you know, you need to start making tape. You know, he's just yelling at big pussy. Like he's yeah. just going to magically make a great fucking tape. Yeah. No, like I would spend hours every day on the phone in person with my sources war gaming. Okay. When was the last time Sonny was in the club? Sonny was the underboss of the Columbo family. He's probably one of the, not, not probably definitely the, the most famous person I investigated. Right. Sonny was a, was a, 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 a hundred and like three or four when he died, just an icon of, of Italian organized crime, an absolute icon, d- dying breed. Um, true to the end, did not cooperate. Didn't never. I never even bothered trying to cooperate him. That's like that's how much respect I had for him in in organized crime. And we would. And w- one of my sources was um, did time with him. I'm thinking it was it might have been Ohio in Ohio. What is film? I might be wrong on that. Anyway, did like six years and they crossed paths and they became um, close with one another, um, which you can't pay for that, right? As an informant. You can't pay to have someone spend six years with the underboss of the Columbo family. And then when he came out, 
he fucked up and he ended up in my care. And so he had that six year history of knowing him. And he was around those people. He was mostly around the Lucchese family. So he had, he had a, what we call a legend. He had a history, he had access. So Sonny, when Sonny came out of jail, started to come around his club. Um, again, parasitic, right? He had very successful clubs on Long Island. So he'd come around and we knew what, what was about to happen. He was going to slowly put his arm around my guy, expect that money, expect that envelope. But in exchange, we now had access to the underboss of the Colombo family. So those discussions we have every day about how to, how to get uh, closer to him without making it obvious he's trying to get closer to him, create scenarios where it seems like the underboss is now being drawn to you as opposed to you showing up like in the movies, like I got this great scam. I want to, you know, it's a, you know, red flag city. You know, you're now, you're now working against someone else to say, how can I get Sonny to ask my guy about something he's involved in and almost make it seem like my guy is reluctant to get him involved, right? It's the girl, it's the girl at the bar the one that gives you too much attention versus the one that's giving you the cold sh- shoulder as a guy and as a girl, you're especially as a girl, you're more drawn to the one that's giving you the cold shoulder for some reason. There's a part of that psychology of like, what's her fucking problem? You know? And it's the same kind of psychology at play during these cases. That is why those movies and these TV shows, you know, Goodfellas and, and the Godfather and, and the Sopranos, clearly having had people involved in the life as consultants, advise them on how to draw these plots out. Because like you said, you 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 start to you start to I don't want to say fall in love, but you start to identify with, you know, Christopher or Adriana or Tony or 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 um, or, or Carmela. Right. What a great what a great plot line to show the real life of a of a wise guy's wife the real life not the movie shit You're right you know, but the the constant infidelity these guys were were cocksmiths they couldn't they they couldn't they couldn't be loyal to their spouses i don't know if i came across one that, that was ever loyal to their to their spouse it was just part of that charisma that they had and and their their you know constant need for that attention from from women but what how disastrous for carmela right there is a real dark side of seeing family around that. I always felt like if you were going to be a gangster, you should be a hundred percent single and solo. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kids, anything, because, you know, even to see, you know, Tony's son start to be confused and think he's a gangster <laughs> and like, that kind of shit. And yeah, I don't think under a lot of people do not understand. And I think the genius of the Sopranos, there was a lot of, first of all, the subtlety of the show was unreal. And the genius of the dark side, like when Christopher first murders and it haunts him. Yeah. I don't think I, you know, he buries the guy and then he's like, he goes and fucking digs him back up. Yeah. Cause he just Move doesn't him. know. And also the old swim with the fishes where they're seeing big pussy at the fish market yeah. on the fish, you know? Yep. I mean, the darkness of that shit is so dark. So you need to almost be an evil motherfucker and a single motherfucker of just like, this is the life I choose. I mean, the Irishman, when you see De Niro just blasting dudes on Christmas Eve, it's just yeah. the shit is real, you know. Yeah, the family part of it is, it's, and I think it goes to the, you know, wanting it all, right? You know, the the most successful gangsters are the ones that either don't have family like that, uh, can devote themselves one hundred percent. And by the way, that's also true of of almost everything, right? Some of the most successful CEOs in history, everything, right? comedy, right, anything. and comedy, right. You, 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 you want to, you know, I want to go do a set. I got to go. I have three kids. I got to go through a list of things I got to make sure are taken care of so I can get out of the house. Who's got to be dropped off. Who's got to be picked up. If, if I were single, I could just pick up and go. Right. That's a compromise. Why? Because I want everything. Right. I want everything. I want a family. I want to be an FBI agent. I want to be, uh, do cyber investigations. I want to be a comic, you know, so you, you, you end up putting yourself in a, 
a less advantageous position as compared to the person next to you who doesn't have all those distractions. So the, so the wise guys, they want the idea of the wife and the kids, but they don't want to be monogamous, right? They don't want to think about what's going to happen when they have a kid and then they have to go to jail for 10 years. What's going to happen to that kid? How fucked up that kid's going to be? Um, you know, what are you going to have to tell that kid to, to make them understand that, that how, you know, how screwed up they're going to be? Um, so they, they want it, they want it all, but the most successful ones, um, were the ones that if they, if they had families, they honestly took the oath seriously enough that their families were second to their, to La Cosa Nostra. That was second, you know, they would, right. they would, they would just, they didn't give a shit. Like they, they, and they, and they told their families, this is the life I've chosen. You chose me. So you have to accept part of this is I might go away for 10 years at some point. At, at any point, do you um, I'm always interested in this because here's your face. You're out. In the, you know, I'm used to those 80s things, blurred out face with a and they came by and I stole the ball. <laughs> the altered voice and everything. But there you are right there. And you were heavily involved in investigating uh, the Colombo family. No fear on that at all or anything. No, I think um, for a few, few reasons, one. I, I live in Long Island and I learned that was a real eye opener when I landed on, on the organized crime squad, when I landed on the Columbus squad, maybe my second day, my supervisor sits down he's like, what's your address? And then he looks up and he goes, here's every wise guy who lives near you. Here's every restaurant you can't go to anymore. Here's every club you can't go to anymore. And I'm like, I'm going to be like, a, I'm going to be like a shut in. <laughs> I, mean, oh. I, can't, I can't even go to half the places. I mean, I used to go to places with my wife um, regularly that I was like, Oh, you're kidding me. Um, so I think that shock and awe part of it, living in Lo Long Island and having so many people live nearby, I, you know, that I would even see, like you'd see them at a Home Depot, just randomly. They didn't know who I was at the time. I got used to that early on. Um, and so I don't worry about it, uh, you know, and this isn't like a machismo thing. I, you know, I'm, I'm very big on, on self-protection and, and, you know, one of the benefits of, of being in the FBI for 10 years or more is you get to leave and I get to carry wherever I go. Um, so I'm very, very vigilant about that. You know, I, I, it was more of a concern of, of honestly, when I started doing stand up, um, that was a bigger concern because I had to figure out, and I'm still figuring it out is how to bring that stuff. My, my concern was getting on stage and saying, so this is what I do. And then the crowd's reaction is always, was always very bullshit. And then I'm always thinking some guys are like, you arrested my dad, you dick. And then like now my set's ruined because some guys in the back that pissed off that I did an ex execute a search warrant on his house three years ago. Um, that was more of a concern than than the violence. They're not stupid enough. Um, they're not stupid enough to do something like that and draw so much attention to them. You know, I just don't worry about it. Maybe I should worry about it more, but I just don't worry about it. Where are they at right now? Are they because they it kind of crumbled and then is it just way, way underground now? So they're still I mean, um, the Colombo family, we really decimated. Um, and I mean, they were a shell of a family when we got done with them. Um, since then, I'm sure they've rebuilt to some extent. But because of the way it happened, you know, I, I, after we after all the trials, we had flipped so many people. I mean, my, my last source was on the administration for the Columbo family. It doesn't get much higher than that. Once you, once the other families saw that, I know there was a period of time where nobody wanted to deal with them. So if you were, uh, you know, in the Genovese family, you weren't dealing with a Columbo guy. Cause there were so many rats at that point. You were like, fuck them, put them on the shelf. They're not, they're, they're, they're on probation, double yeah. secret probation. So I'm sure they've come back you know, by now from that, but just organized crime generally, it's so much harder to get away with now. Um, that's one of the things that I kind of tweet about. Again, I just love going through the Sopranos now with having been through that and now seeing it like the recorders, you know, big pussies got this looks like a Walkman. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, oh my God. And they used to have, they were called Nagras. They were these reel to reels. They did used to give those to cooperators. That's all they had, which the stones you'd have to have to walk into a meeting with like a, a lunchbox size recorder on you is insane. I mean, that's got to be the scariest yeah. ever. You know, you're yeah, just no in there. And, you know, now, I mean, they're like probably like the size could be of anything like, a, yeah, a pen, you know, like so you know. when I got there, we 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 had some devices that were 
definitely a lot smaller than big pussies, but still I would consider them or call them artificial, right? They're devices that you shouldn't have. Like there's no logical explanation for this type of device to have on you. But um, during, during my time there, technology miniaturization of electronics really between that, you know, 2002 to, you know, 2012 time period, everyone started carrying electronics a lot more. Everyone cars, of course, now we have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and GPS. So it wasn't unusual to have certain types of devices in and around you. And that opened the door up for the, for the FBI to say, well, we can secrete a recording device into almost anything. So, you know, I laugh now, like back in the day, if you, if your car was transmitting, there was no explanation for that. Now, if someone said to me, if someone swept my source's car and so your car's transmitting, I'd, be, I'd tell my source, yeah, rattle off the list. What do you think it is? Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS. Um, uh, you know, oh, there's a microphone in my car. Yeah, it's for the Bluetooth. I mean, you're, you'd be there for, for four days trying to figure out what, what it is. So that plays against cr- uh, um, criminals because if their whole purpose is to not be recorded um, in, in 2021, that's that's a that's a tall order. I mean, you have to go yeah. into the woods. <laughs> you, know, you have to be naked in the woods. I watch sometimes you watch one of those like fucking first 48s or whatever these yeah. shows are. These dumb, you know, you're in a hotel room on the road. I don't watch TV, but I'll put one on and I'm like, I don't know how you think you're going to get, get away with anything, <laughs> with anything, yeah. unless you're out in the desert solo, right. no cell phone and just jeans and a T-shirt on. You know, you're you're not going to. It's just think about it. Do you have, play it out in your mind? Right. I, I, I do this kind of thought experiment all the time. I'll be driving and I'll be like, all right, let's say I'm going to murder my wife just arbitrarily or randomly. Like, I think, you know, how would you get away with something like that? Which brings me to anyway, your new world of cyber security and cyber uh cyber detective and stuff like that. The Bitcoin was basically invented to buy stuff on the internet, correct? No. So it's actually way bigger than that. And it's why why I believe in it so much. Um, Bitcoin was created by a guy um, whose name is Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't know if it's a pseudonym or not, but a guy or a group of people that after the 2008 economic collapse, and all the subsequent bailouts um, was disgusted at the fact that we had the government printing money to bail out companies that full well knew the risks of what they were doing. And yet they're using our tax dollars to bail them out. And what that means is, is you're inadvertently devaluing the dollars in my pocket because the the right basic economic principle, the more of anything that exists, the less valuable it is. Like right now, they're just printing money. Printing money. Just fucking brr, like 1.9 trillion, and everyone's like, "This is great." And I'm, and you have to explain to people if there's no labor attached to the dollar, it's like you're fucking printing toilet paper. Yep. Right. That's how Venezuela. There's money just littering the streets, and people don't understand that. They go, "Why can't you go in the store?" Because there's so much of it. So what? That so what? If everybody, if you give a million dollars to everybody, people don't. People think that's you can you can print your money enough money to bring people out of poverty. That's not how that works. That's not how economics work. So he built, he designed this Bitcoin protocol, which had never been seen before on the planet, um, based on on a consensus and a blockchain, which essentially says that we're going to create, using the technology that we have for the first time in human history available, we're going to create digital currency, a digital store of value that the government can't take from you. Can't devalue. They can't. They can't devalue. They can't make more Bitcoin. There's going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever, period. There is no way to for the government to go, oh, we're just going to make it 40 million because a few people want a little bit more. And we've got some buddies over here at Wells Fargo. and We're going to give some to them. And they can't do that. It's completely decentralized. And so um, oh, hold on he writes this white paper. Can't they just, yep. yeah, go whoever the people are that invented it, can't they just make some more Bitcoins or a Bitcoin split off? No. No. I'm just trying no, to so, get, I'm just trying to get, no, no. Yeah. These are, these are questions that you have to ask conceptually to start to wrap your mind around how this all works, right? There's, there's, there's so many questions to ask and you have to really start thinking about them and turning, turning your brain on them to, to figure that out. But, but no, so the rules, think of it this way. 
someone designed, someone, someone designed, if you grew up with an Atari or a Nintendo, once that game was designed and the rules of, of Super Mario Brother were designed and you brought that home, there was no ability for them to change the rule. And suddenly now Mario jumps twice as high or has fireballs. The game has been printed. It's done. The game of Bitcoin, the rules of Bitcoin have been created. They've been then distribute the software and everybody installs it. In order for the rules to change, 51% of the world who are involved in Bitcoin, their computers have to decide essentially to change the rules. And there's zero incentive for them to change the rules to create more than 21 million Bitcoin because the people who are the Bitcoin miners and the people doing it have a vested interest in protecting that. The fact that is it is anti-inflationary, you cannot create more. So he, even as the creator, he could decide tomorrow, he woke up, wake up and he could make himself public and say, I made a mistake. We should have 25 million Bitcoin. He has zero ability to change that. It's not like he owns the master code and he can go and it's now been released into the wild and it's up to the Bitcoin community to decide what the rules are. And the rules will never change. If it forks off and somebody says, I'm going to change the rules, you end up with different types of crypto cryptocurrency, Bitcoin Cash, BSV. That's not Bitcoin, right? So the, the Bitcoin stays pure. People fork off into these different directions, but it becomes different cryptocurrencies that, that get valued in the way that they are, that they're not very valuable. Um, so that's what's kind of neat about it. Now, how... Well, first of all, how do you buy a Bitcoin and how are these guys using Bitcoin to buy drugs and everything on the Silk Highway when the Bitcoins are so much money? Was it when they were really cheap back then or how does this work? No, So this is one of the biggest misconceptions um, that the Bitcoin community is working hard to solve how to change that perception, which is. People are like, I can't afford Bitcoin. You can buy five dollars of Bitcoin. Oh, yeah, a whole, a whole Bitcoin's at fifty-seven seven right now. Uh -huh. Not many people in the country in the world are going to have fifty-seven thousand dollars laying around to go buy a whole Bitcoin. You can buy five dollars worth. In fact, that's what I recommend to people: is the dollar cost average. Set up an auto buy once a week. That on through Coinbase or Gemini, you will purchase whatever you can afford. That you can say, this is my investment. It's a hundred dollars a week. It's twenty dollars a week. It's a thousand dollars a week. And you will accumulate over time large amounts. Now, back then, yeah, Bitcoin, when Silk Road was, was running, Bitcoin was at like, you know, $60, $70. So when you look at the prices for like, you know, it'll be like an ounce of, of weed and it might be like, you know, five Bitcoin. You're like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's not, it's not, it wasn't $60,000. Right, back. right, right. So you can buy $5 of Bitcoin. Yes. Now, is that, there's 21,000 Bitcoins? Million. Oh, 21 million. There will be. Yeah. It, it eventually it's not, there's only been about 18 million ever released to this point. So if I'm buying $5 a Bitcoin a week or a hundred dollars, is that someone selling part of their Bitcoin? Like say a coin's a pie, are they just pieing out their Bitcoin? Exactly. And what it's not is someone artificially creating more Bitcoin to satisfy the fact that there's a high demand. So think about this. There's nothing in the, on the planet, nothing in the universe that operates irrespective of demand. Meaning you tell me, if you tell me tomorrow, the next big craze is, uh, you know, arcade machines, right? right? Arcade cabinet machines. Well, there are companies that are going to pop up and just make more and more arcade machines to s satisfy the demand for arcade machines. Everyone on the planet tomorrow could wake up and decide we need Bitcoin. And there's never going to be more than 21 million Bitcoin, period. And that's what makes it anti-inflationary. And that's why the price, when I first got into Bitcoin, God, it must have been, you know, I don't know, 50 bucks of Bitcoin, right? And what I'm like, oh, I missed it. It's $50 of Bitcoin. And I really started getting into it. And then it hit $100. I'm like, oh, I totally fucking missed this. $1,000, $1,500. The reason why it's going to be going to go up in value in a very predictable way is because we there's a for, for the first time in, in history we have a, an asset that cannot be there's not going to be more of it created so the, the demand's going to go up but the supply is never going to increase for that thing so it's going to make the price go up so yes to your to exactly as you said if you go on coinbase and you buy some bitcoin you're buying from what we say in the community you're buying from someone who has weak hands right dave portnoy right who's hysterical the guy from barstool sports right he got into Bitcoin early on, freaked out because it's volatile day to day, sold all his shit. And now it's gone up, I don't know, probably like 10x since he sold all his shit. 
right? And, and he's dealing with and, and he's dealing with the trauma of this. And we've all been through it. I've been through it too, right? I was, you know, I've sold Bitcoin and I'm, I'm, I've kicked myself for it just, you know, a year or two later kind of thing. But those, I had weak hands, right? People have weak hands and will sell. And then gives opportunities for people like us to buy it. And the more people, that's where this expression comes from, HODL. Um, it comes from, it's, it's supposed to be hold. Right. But back in the day, some guy who was a Bitcoin fanatic, I mean, this is like 2012, there was this big debate on one of the forums that was discussing Bitcoin. And he's like, I don't give a shit. I'm fucking hodling. And it just caught on. People were like, yeah, I'm hodling too. Yeah. And, it's, it, and it's become this expression in the community that when people, people ask me, so just today, a friend of mine goes, do you still trade Bitcoin? I say, no, I fucking hodl Bitcoin. I buy it. I don't, I've mined it, but I'm not selling it. So I, I, ho- I hold, hold it because I, I believe um, that it will continue to go up in value, that it'll be something that can be very liberating for people, for the average person, that I can have an asset that the, that, that the government, that nobody can take from me, um, you know, regardless of, of whatever. Like if, if, um, if you have a bunch of gold bullion in your house, right? That's the closest analogy, right? Is that Bitcoin's becoming gold 2.0. And people say, well, what about gold? Gold's got all sorts of problems attached to it. Not the least of which is someone could come into your house. The government could come into your house. Someone could, a burglar could come into your house and take your gold, right? You can't stop them from seizing it. But if they come to you and say, hey, um, we want your Bitcoin, right? The expression is, oh, my Bitcoin, I lost it in a boating accident. You'll never believe it, right? It's because- you don't, if you don't own the private key to that Bitcoin, there's nothing anyone can do to compel you to unlock that Bitcoin for them. So it just it just sits in the ether forever, for an, forever and ever. And again, it's not that I'm anti-government. I'm just I'm just I'm just I'm a constitutionalist at heart. I'm 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 someone who believes in. I don't like the fact that anybody can devalue the money I work really hard for by printing trillions of it, and I didn't even get to fucking vote on that. You didn't get to vote on that. What about? people hacking to get your Bitcoin. Is that possible? So this is going to blow your mind, right? So Bitcoin doesn't actually exist in, uh, there is no physical um, manifestation of Bitcoin, right? People will say, oh, my phone got hacked, my computer got hacked, and I lost all my Bitcoin. What they're really saying is that somebody got access to their computer, whether physically or remoted into their computer, um, and they were keeping their Bitcoin in such a way that through a wallet that was not secured properly. And they were able to basically send that Bitcoin out to the other person's address. And now it's gone forever. There's no way you're ever going to get that back. Wow. But here's the thing that, that, that um, there's ways to mitigate that, right? And one of the ways to mitigate that is you don't actually need to keep um, a wallet that holds your Bitcoin on your phone or your computer. I, I actually don't recommend doing that. There's ways for you to set it up so that you can buy Bitcoin from, let's say, Gemini or Coinbase have it sent to an address that you own. And that the way to unlock that exists on, it could be a piece of paper with 12 words you read on it called a mnemonic that, that those 12 words unlock your Bitcoin. So when, as people start to get into Bitcoin and go, okay, now let's say I have a large amount on sitting on an exchange and the exchanges are a lot more secure than they used to be. But let's say you had half a million dollars on an exchange. You're like, I'm just not comfortable. And I agree with you. You shouldn't keep large amounts of that on an exchange. I want to self custody. I want to move it to a private wallet. Then there's a process I walk my friends and family through to say, this is how we're going to take it from the exchange, move it to something secure, and then set up a redundancy so that if your house burns down or your house gets burglarized and someone took something, even if they knew what the fuck it was, you'd be able to recover it very, very quickly before they could do anything with it. And what that means, you can memorize for your wallet a 12 a uh, word seed, a mnemonic it's called, that you can go anywhere in the world and sit in front of a computer, enter in those 12 words and unlock your Bitcoin. How amazing is that? Unlock them from where? From, from the blockchain, from the ether. There is, because it's decentralized, it's not like you can, it's not like you have to log into, um, you know, uh, you know, Bitcoin.com. They don't, it's decentralized, right? That's the beauty of it. There's no chase.com, Wells Fargo.com. The way the blockchain works and the way that the way that Bitcoin works is it's based, it's based on what's called cryptographic key pairs. Essentially, you have a public address that I can tell the word, world. If I want to get paid, I can show you my public address on the computer right now. And the whole world can know that. It doesn't present a security risk to me. The only thing they can do is send me money or go on the internet and see how much Bitcoin I have associated with that address. Um, if, if I want to um, access that, I need what's called a private key, which is basically think of it as a super complex password. 
that you don't create, that is created for you. It's a key pair. So it's like a, a pot and a lid. When you create a when you create a lid, the pot comes with it. You have to memorize the password for the pot, which is like you know 52 characters long that you can't possibly remember. But using an algorithm, that 52 character um, uh, private key can be reduced into 12 random words that then can be reversed into the private key. Wow! So instead of if you know how the internet works, right? The internet when you type in www.mcdonalds.com. Uh, it's taking McDonald's.com and it's through the through DNS, it's going to an IP address. Well, why don't we use the IP address? Because no one's going to remember 227.172. No one's going to remember that. They want to go to McDonald's.com. So think of it in, in, in an anal- and it's analogous to that where the private key can be reduced to 12 words, which you can remember 12 words, and you can go in front of a computer. And that means from anywhere in the world, no one can lock you out of that. If you know those 12 words, the government bad guys, anything can happen. And as long as you're the only person who knew those 12 words, you can go to any computer in the world, get your pirate key and unlock your and unlock your funds. That's the first time in history that we've had something that is that secure that you, you know, this country could go to complete fascism tomorrow and there's going to be nothing they can do to, to, to be able to unlock and steal your Bitcoin without your consent. Now, who's the guy who died and there's a bunch of bitcoins, and and I guess his family or whatever is trying to figure out the fucking the key pa- pass key, and those are just going to be just lost forever. Lost forever. Who's that guy? Was it the guy that? Uh, is it Ross or is it? Or is it- no, no. Ro- Ro- Ross is still alive. Um, he he's still in prison. Um, I don't know if I know about the guy who died. I know there's a guy with a thumb drive that was recently in the news, like in the last four months. And he put it on what's called an iron key, the private key. Yeah. And the iron key is designed after 10 wrong attempts. It, it erases <sighs> your thing. So there's like $250 million or something like that on this thing, which, which again, it's like, it's like hell, right? Imagine knowing you're looking at a thing with 250 million on it and you've got two chances left before it wipes itself out. So the problem is, is that twofold is that he didn't secure that properly, obviously. And also, I guarantee you, the reason why there's so much on there is because he bought a bunch. And I have, I have very personally, uh, my wife has a friend who we were at dinner in 2000 and I don't know, 13, 14. And at dinner, I somehow Bitcoin came up probably because fucking I probably brought it up because at that point I was even more obsessed. And as a proof of concept, I had her create a wallet on her phone and I sent her like 10 bucks. This is when Bitcoin was like a hundred dollars. So she, you know, she contacted my wife recently and is like, Hey, can I access it? And I said, technically, yes, but I guarantee I know what she did. She fucking threw the phone in the garbage or gave it back to Verizon. Um, and it's gone. So she actually still had the phone. It was just in a different house somewhere. She tracked it down, but can't remember her pin code. I think it's the last that I heard. So she's locked out of a considerable amount of money that that technically is there and is lost forever. This is because at the time she was like, it's $10. Right. What does it matter? It's $10. So um, people back then were not taking good care of a lot of Bitcoin. You can go on the forums from 2011. There's one guy who's like, oh, I love reading them. It's like, uh, yeah, I'm so pissed. I, I totally screwed up. I, I missed the boat. I only have 600 Bitcoin, um, uh, uh, you know. You know, I guess I'll just have to accept whatever it is. Six hundred Bitcoin, yeah, right. Six hundred millions of dollars, yeah. right. This guy is talking about how he missed the boat, right? <laughs> a lot of people. There's one guy who's trying to get to a landfill. He threw out some computers with millions of dollars of Bitcoin. He's trying to pay the government to let him dig up a landfill to find his own hard drives to try to pull his Bitcoin off of it. Oh. Um, so, so those horror stories uh, do exist, but they'll be less common now that people are understanding the value of it and that even a small amount of bitcoin is can be worth you know a lot of money they're going to be able they're going to be taking care of them a lot more than they used to now i did see some people are accepting bitcoin on home purchases and stuff now how does that work because you would have to have the deed in your hand and go okay here's the bitcoin switch you know like how would that work yeah, I mean, you still have to have like a closing. You could never just send it to someone and hope they sent you the deed. Right. I think the bottom line is it would just get to the point of where you'd have to pay. And instead of a bank making a transfer, you drop in cash on the table. You'd say, okay, we're sitting at a table. I'm sending you the money right now. And Bitcoin settles. At most, Bitcoin would take typically an hour to settle, um, to fully settle, meaning the money that's transferred 
is uh, irrevocable that the person after after about an hour, there's no ability that that money is not going to be in your wallet a day, a week, a year from now. Once it settles, it's locked in there. And then, then you know, look, I would do it. Um, there's stories about people doing that years ago and how much the proper, property, what they really ended up selling it for. And of course, they're killing themselves. And that's the whole Tesla thing, right? Is that Elon... Elon selling um, again. He he actually was selling Teslas back in in 2013 ish. Um, I know someone who bought a Tesla with Bitcoin, but it's brilliant, right? Because Elon and 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 and, and Tesla um, purchased about 1.5 billion dollars worth of Bitcoin right. this year, and um, Elon finally, I think, starting to really understand and accept kind of what the role Bitcoin is going to play. He's selling Teslas for Bitcoin now. People say, Vinny, would you buy one? Well, no, because the, the I, Bitcoin's gonna I'm not going to keep going up. And yeah, the I'm not going to go trade. Yeah. Right. I'm looking at Bitcoin 10 years from now going, it, it, it's going to be the, one of the most appreciating asset classes. Why would I trade that for one of the most uh, de, one of the most depreciating asset? A car is one of the worst purchases yeah. anyone could ever make. Drive it right? off the lot and it's so worth he's, a quarter. <laughs> yeah, he's brilliant, right? I tweeted this, you know, uh, uh, when this first came out, if they're thinking about it, like, would I buy a Tesla? Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. It's kind of neat, you know. But then I said, he's not he's not selling cars for Bitcoin. He's trading cars for Bitcoin. He's saying, take this fucking car, give me your Bitcoin, yeah. because I know that that Bitcoin is going to be worth a tremendous amount more money uh, 10 years from now than the car will ever be, or the cash will be for that matter. The cash is a liability. The cash is going to continue to depreciate over time. Um, Bitcoin for the people like me believe very staunchly that Bitcoin is going to continue to go up. So for right now, there's nothing I would probably spend, set, uh, sp- spend my Bitcoin on because there's nothing that I would see that I could trade it for that would actually be an improvement, a step up. What about the knockoffs? What is it? The fucking dogma? Coins. What is it? Yeah. Doge. Yeah. So, so I try not to be too harsh on this. I, 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 so there's like, people have to understand there's about 8,000 other cryptocurrencies, 8,000. Um, oh, there sort is? Of oh, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, you only hear about the top probably 30 or 40, but there's coins you fucking wouldn't believe. I've only heard about two, Bitcoin and the dogma. <laughs> now there's, you know, look, there's Bitcoin Cash, um, uh, BSV, there's Ethereum, Dogecoin, Cardano. I mean, you name it. I've played around with some of those. I've even mined, um, you know, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, the bottom line is that my personal opinion is that Bitcoin will remain the fastest horse in the race for a long time to come for a lot of different reasons. Um, most importantly, is that Bitcoin is fucking battle tested, right? Bitcoin has seen some shit. Like if Bitcoin was a person, he'd be sitting in your basement with that thousand yard stare and you'd be like, that fucking guy has seen some shit. Bitcoin's been attacked technologically. Bitcoin's been attacked politically. Bitcoin's been attacked by the government. Bitcoin's been attacked by corporations. And it's like the fucking Terminator. Bitcoin goes into the explosion. And you're like, that's the death of Bitcoin. And he just comes walking out five minutes later. And you're like, how is that possible? So for me personally, having witnessed this firsthand, you know, the 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 premature um uh, proclamation that Bitcoin's dead is it's up to like there's a website that counts it. It's something like 400 times in the last 11 years. There have been official announcements by the media that Bitcoin is dead. The Bitcoin experiment is over and it's only come back bigger and more expensive and it's only grown in adoption. So for me, when I look at something like that, if I'm going to put my money someplace, I want to put my money someplace that has been through some shit. So I know that it's hard money. Bitcoin is hard money. The other coins are interesting. And some of them, honestly, if you would have put like pen to pad and look at what the potential adv- advantages of them are, they have some advantages over Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin Cash, for example, has a larger block size, which means it can handle more transactions faster than Bitcoin can, right? That's that's a big deal. It's a big deal if you're looking to use your Bitcoin to buy a soda. Not a big deal if you're looking to use your Bitcoin to buy a house, right? I can sit around for 10 minutes for a block to settle when I buy a house or an hour for, for a, a transaction to completely settle to buy um, a house, I don't want to sit around and buy a soda with it. So is there room in the market for two products to exist, two coins? Yes. But I look at the what I'd rather have my money in is the thing that people trust to buy a house with. That's where I want my money with. Where right. someone says, no, I'll buy a house. I'll take a house, you know, buy a house with Bitcoin because it's been that been battle tested. So people always are constantly asking me. And just today I had a conversation with my, my roommate from college and he's like, 
you know, it's inevitable. You get into Bitcoin and what happens is you start looking for the next Bitcoin. It's inevitable. I, I, I see this evolution through all my friends and family. Once they get the bug and they start researching, I heard this is going to be the next Bitcoin. Well, you could roll the dice and you might be right on that. But what I'm telling you is look up the chart for what Bitcoin's done in 11 years. And it's got compounded growth of 200% on average in the last 11 years. If that trend continues, why are you getting greedy trying to roll the dice on some fucking flavor of the week coin when the everything you're looking at is telling you this thing was worth less than a penny in 2011 and it's worth $57,477 as I'm sitting here right now. <laughs> and, if, and then you're like, but yeah, is there something better? Yeah. <laughs> what? What fucking could be better? That's like I, the percentage growth is like 400,000%. I looked it up one day. It's hysterical. It's like, that's not good enough for you over a decade, 400,000% growth. Yeah. Give me a break. If you look at all time, and I'd have to double check on this. So Bitcoin's up all time, 84,000% since creation in 11 years. 84,000% return yeah. Yeah. since uh, since creation. There were sites giving out Bitcoin. There were sites, these Bitcoin fa faucets. If you went and filled out a survey, they'd give you five Bitcoin in 2011. <laughs> now, five full Bitcoins? Yes. Wow. How many how many coins you got? I that's first rule of Bitcoin is you never tell anybody how many coins you have. Really? Um and uh, yeah, you, you it's just stupid to do so. Like it, it's it's just a uh, it, it's just it can't it can't possibly benefit you in any way. What I will say is not enough. And that's a constant feeling I have is not enough. Right. Not enough Bitcoin. But I still I still buy it. Like, you know, um I still buy it very regularly. And that's what I recommend to people is every time it it crashes and there's a dip. Um, you know, you buy the dips. You buy even if it's just a couple hundred bucks. You just buy it every time it, it crashes, and then over time, you're gonna you're gonna be sitting on. I think in the future, like in ten years' time, even people owning one bitcoin is gonna be almost unheard of. There will be a very small percentage of the world that actually has one bitcoin. You might be able to own point one bitcoin in ten years from now and be incredibly wealthy from that, which is insane to think about. But I believe it. Now, you coming from the cyber FBI world, has nobody able to really crack who started Bitcoin? And why are the people keeping it a secret or the one person or whoever it was that started it? Because I think he's a, a time traveler is my, my deep down side <laughs> answer. So I have theories on that, right? You know, uh, this kind of feeds into my belief that all of this is a simulation. And that's another conversation. But um, if this were a simulation, there would be points in history where things would could get inserted into the simulation to sort of tinker with where the society could have gone, would have gone had those changes happened. And those those things might happen in a way where something almost comes out of nowhere. You know, what would the what would what would this civilization have looked like if they moved away from government controlled currency to decentralized currency? OK, update that. Put that put that update into the code into the simulation and release it, and the person will just disappear, and no one will ever know who he is. The more normal, non sort of trippy answer that I give people is that there are people that come across once in a century type individuals that truly do not have uh, the normal types of interests in in accumulation of wealth and fame that a lot of people do. That the most of society has right that recognition. There are people that come along and, you know, Mozart would have created those symphonies re regardless of whether he was going to make money on it or not. There are special people like that that believe that their contribution to humanity is, is the reward in and of itself. And so the a person, and if you read Satoshi's writings, a person who is disgusted with the abuse of our currency um, and the way that it can impact all of us and who has the intellect to create something like a symphony that's never been heard before um, to better the planet. Those are the same type of people that aren't going to go around being like, check out my fucking Lambos. Like those people don't care about Lamborghinis. They don't care about that. Um, so he Satoshi is, would be one of the wealthiest individuals on the planet. I think when Bitcoin hits like a hundred and something thousand, he will be officially the wealthiest um, man on the planet in a Bitcoin sense, because he mined um, he mined Bitcoin, which is basically when you you use a computer to process Bitcoin transactions and discover blocks, you get a reward. So he has I forget how many thousands of Bitcoin that we everyone knows he's sitting on have never moved because we know his address because he was public about it. We can see it on the blockchain; it's never moved. A penny of it has never left. Now, 
maybe 20 years from now, he cashes out. Who, who knows? My guess is, is that it's either an individual or a group of individuals that understood that the what they were doing had a greater purpose than just financial gain. And that that'll never be, that Bitcoin will never be, be used. That's, that's my personal belief. Or the time traveler simulation thing, which is a longer discussion. I don't think there's no way it's a group of people because that old saying, three can keep a secret if two are dead. There's just no way. There's there, in the human, the way the human works is fucking, there's no three exact, like we'll keep this secret to the grave. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, agreed. There's also like, there's all sorts of, you could go really down the rabbit hole. If you take Nakamoto, I think, if you take the, the letters of Nakamoto as an acronym, there are people that have, you know, theories that each of the letters in the last name represent an actual company. Uh, wow. Like Nikon, Nikon, and I forget now. Yeah, and me- meaning these were people. This this was actually created by companies, um, maybe brilliant people at companies who didn't want again didn't want the recognition specifically, but understood that it was more important to create something. So people got together and 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 released it in, in such a way. Um, you also, by the way, the part of the power of Bitcoin is not knowing who created it. Can you fucking imagine in today's culture if this guy had like a Twitter account? And God forbid, made a fucking off-color joke. Oh. What that would do to the price of Bitcoin? Can you fucking imagine? <laughs> canceled Bitcoin. Bitcoin's been canceled. Yeah, Bitcoin creator yeah. Nak- yeah, yeah. <laughs> Satoshi Nakamoto, yeah. you know, spoke out again on race today. Yeah. Oh my God, no! Yeah. So I, I want, I want, I want the person behind it to be as sort of anonymous as possible. I, I mentioned I'm, I'm a constitutionalist at heart, right? You know the. The Constitution being, you know, the greatest document, in my opinion, ever non-religious document ever created. But even now, to prove my point, even now, the people who created the greatest document, the 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 the, the thing that that uh, acknowledge individual human rights, uh, separate and apart from government, the thing that the thing that that set forth, you know, creating the most prosperous. Um, greatest country in the history of civilization. Even the founders of this thing are under attack. They're being judged by today's standards of who did fucking what 200 and something years ago. For, for God's sakes, right? So to my point, it, it would almost be better if the, if the constitution, you didn't know who fucking wrote it at this point. Yeah. Because it, it, someone, someone who was imperfect, and logically we were all imperfect, we were all deeply flawed. Imperfect people can create perfection, right? You know, you, you know, Mozart could have went home and slapped his fucking dog. You know, he could have he could have been a serial killer for all we know. It doesn't take away from the beauty of the symphony, right? And so, to me, I love the fact that Satoshi is unknown, and I, I honestly hope that we never really he never reveals himself because he's putting a bullseye on him, and no human being is going to be able to live up to that scrutiny. Yeah. So now your life is. Cybersecurity is that what you do? Do people hire you? And what what's your gig now? Yeah, so companies. So I do corporate breaches, which means um, so when I left the government, uh, the re- one of the reasons I left was because we're dealing with all these breach cases, right? Like you know, Home Depot gets breached, breach, and J.P. Morgan gets breached. They go to the FBI, and the FBI investigates. But there's like there was a big there was a big need for there to be a private um, sector counterpart to help the bank out, to help the Home Depot out, whoever it may be. Meaning the FBI, we can advise on certain things, but we're interested in catching the bad guys. If they're like, so should we, is it okay to put our network back online? Um, Can you tell us what data was stolen? If that doesn't pertain to the investigation, the FBI, rightfully so, is not going to spend time doing your dirty work. They're going to be like, hey, you need to figure that out for your own, you know. Right, it's your company. We're just looking for the your company. Exactly. Right. So, so, you know, if you think about it, right, if there's a murder in your house, the cops come there to investigate and then you don't go, Hey, can you tell me, can I, is it okay that walls wet? Can I, it, will mildew grow there? Can I do Should I replace the sheetrock? You're like, I'm not here for that. Like you have to call a company that deals with that. So I left with four other people from the FBI to start a cyber defense practice to kind of put those clients in a position to have that experience from the FBI. And when they go, we've just had a breach, we're going to call the FBI to say, okay, great. Here's what the FBI is going to want. Let's give them this so they can go do that part of it. Here's what you need to be worried about. You need to be worried about what data left your network. Are they still in your network? Um, so um, that eventually grew after a couple of years at this one company. And then we had an opportunity to, to, to start a full-fledged 
um, startup, which was another dream of mine. And we broke off from the one company we're at with their support. They were supporting us. And we got a CEO from uh, Morgan Stanley came over. The COO from Morgan Stanley came over and, um, I don't know, raised like a couple hundred million dollars to start this new cybersecurity company um, with my team as part of the part of the whole cybersecurity services that we provide. So now companies get breached. They say, hey, we're hit with ransomware. All of our devices are locked up. They'll call us to say, what do we do? Like we have a bad guy demanding $20 million to decrypt our network. Right. We can't function. Our entire network's down. You know, this could be a school. This could be a hospital. This could be a pl- uh, 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 a police station. A water plant. Everything across the board. Gas a power. A water plant. Anything. A gas power. Anything. And so we go in and while dealing with the negotiation part of it and kind of walking them through that process, we're also going to be doing the investigation into how you got popped in the first place, because that's critically important, because how do you fix something if you don't first identify what what broke? And so that's what I do is like kind of my, my normal day to day. I run a team of, of you know, brilliant uh, forensic examiners that we untangle these these breaches and lay that out for our clients to say, this is exactly what happened. This is how you can fix it. These are all, this is all the data that's gone. So now you have to notify, you know, you've received the letter in the mail. We all have, right? Of course. Your data was lost. It, if every time you get that letter, there was an investigation from a team like mine that actually figured out what data left so that you get the letter and your neighbor doesn't get a letter. That all has to be, you know, untangled. And at what point do you start to get into comedy? You're out there in the East Coast where you always watch a comedy or what, 44 or something. How, yeah, how do you get yeah. into it? I, I couldn't do stand up uh, well at the FBI, right? It's just, it's just a, there's just no way you can do that. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you imagine? Can you imagine? There, right? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, imagine being on the stand testifying. They're like, yeah, some, some defense attorney gets a hold of one of your bits. And yeah. he's like, is it true that yeah. you talked about murdering your wife? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like it's funnier. It's funnier in context. I swear. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's just no way. So I was always interested in, even since I was a kid, you know, that was something I wanted to do, but I don't know about you when you're told that as a kid, I was a, I was a, I was a bad kid. I got in a lot of trouble when I was younger, just disruptive and shit like that. And like your teacher would pull you aside and be like, Hey, if you want to be a comic, you know, go be a comedian. I always took it as an insult just because I didn't know anything about comedy and my parents kind of being first generation. I could never imagine being like, so I know you came to this country with these lofty goals. Here's what I want to do. I want to tell jokes. Yeah. Like it just didn't even occur to me. Right. Um, and so it was always in the back of my mind. I would go see comedy shows. There was a, com- a comedy club, a brokerage comedy um, club right down the street from where I was living at the time while I was in the FBI. My wife would go there. And then I became friendly with the owner there through a mutual friend of mine. And uh, I went one time to see a show with the mutual friend. And he's like, oh, I've seen you here. And I was like, yeah, you know, I've seen you a bunch. And, and he was like I was. He wasn't looking for new friends. You know, he was a little bit. He was friendly, but a little bit standoffish. And that's kind of how I was, especially when I was at the FBI. I don't know who you are and I don't want to, you know, whatever. So then I started going back there. We became friendlier. And then when I left the FBI, um, we were doing a fundraiser for uh, my wife's friend for their kid or something. And I think the MC didn't show up. And so I had known the owner enough where he's like, go, you're going to, you're going to host and I was like, yeah, right. I'm going to go host. I was like, I'll go do a fucking type five. He's like, no, seriously. He's like, the, the MC can't make it. They're stuck or whatever. He's like, I know you can do it. Just go do it. So I did it. And I, of course, I loved it. Yeah. Right. And, and with no pressure, right? Like, I'm not even supposed to be here kind of thing. So, you know, you interact with the crowd a little bit. Uh, you get a few laughs and you know the deal. Then the adrenaline rush happens. The addiction kicks in. And so I didn't think anything of it. We We left. And he, you know, I got off stage and he, and he saw me kind of smile. He's like, oh, I, I knew you'd love it, you know? And I said, yeah, yeah. Then we came back like a week later um, to go get dinner and watch a show. And I shit you not, he, uh, like two minutes before the show comes on, he goes, all right, it's going to be uh, so-and-so is hosting. You're going to go up, do like three minutes. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, just go do like three minutes. And I'm, I'm like, I'm eating dinner. Like I'm about to, I'm with my wife and and I know from having comic friends how valuable stage time is. Yeah. So the idea of saying no was like throwing it in the garbage. And so I looked at my wife and she's like, do it. And I was like, I'm thinking, all right, I'm not in the FBI anymore. Like, what's the worst that can happen? They don't laugh. This is the worst that can happen. So I go up and I do a few minutes and I love it. And then, you know, then it, then every time I went there, he would force me on stage. Like I, I, every time I go, he owns three clubs. Every time I went, 
he would just find a spot for me, which is, which you think about like, what a, what a gift that is, right. To have somebody kind of pushing you in that direction and giving you that. I mean, again, this is all a simulation that doesn't happen in real life that, you know, something I wanted to do as a kid doesn't happen when I'm 37 years old. It just, it shouldn't happen that way. And that was it. And so then, you know, uh, I have three, these three clubs are within 10 minutes of where I live. And so, you know, I, I've just been doing it ever since. So I, I started it probably in 2000, it's probably late 2015, early 2016, I would say is when I started doing it. And then, you know, with the exception of the hiatus for COVID, they were doing outdoor shows for a while, you know, in March, everything kind of closed down. Then he reopened in, uh, in the summertime and built this beautiful outdoor stage. He was open for like a month. I went up like as many times as I could, like 10 times in probably like a week and a half. You know, just every single show was like, can I get a spot? Can I get a spot? Because it was real people. And then that got shut down. And I don't know about you. I kind of accepted. I said, well, I'm just going to, I'm not going to think about it because it's too painful to think about it. And I, and I, and that's how I deal with things in life. Maybe not so healthy. I just pushed it out of my mind. And I was like, I'm not doing zoom shows. I'm not doing any of that. Yep. And then I went to Atlantic city with a friend and they were doing a live show there. And I was backstage and I got like a little emotional. I was like thinking of, I was hearing the crowd laugh and I peeked around the corner and I got upset. I got a little like fucking pissed. And I was like, I missed this. This is such bullshit. And then um, they, he was like, go do a spot. And I was like, I haven't been on stage since August. I'm not going to go tank. You know, you know how important psychology is in, 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 you know, the last sets I did were good. Yeah. I wanted to, I went out on a high. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go bomb in Atlantic city and then be like, I totally lost any momentum I have. So I didn't do it. And then I was furious with myself on the ride home. I'm saying to my wife, I can't believe I had an opportunity to do that. And I had to say no, because I wasn't ready. And so then I got home and I said to my wife, I think I got to start doing Zoom shows because it's better than nothing. So I did Zoom shows like the last, you know, few months, which is, you know, the Zoom setup he has is ridiculous. It's three giant projector screens. It's as good as you're going to get, right. but it's Zoom. It's like dancing with yourself with no music, right. right? There's no, it's not comedy. And then he just opened last week. So I finally got back on stage last week or the week before I forget and actually had a real crowd and I'll be back up uh, this Saturday in front of a real crowd. So yeah, it's pretty exciting. Did you, did you stop going up all together? What, what, what have you been doing? Yeah. I didn't go on at all for eight months. <laughs> I wasn't going to do a zoom show. I could give I a fuck about zoom. You know, it yeah. was like, to me, that's not what I got into it for. I'm not doing it. Like I must perform. I do it as cliche as this must sound for the art of it. It's the art of me and the room being in this place at the same time and the danger of that and the feeling of that. There's nothing like it. So staring at a TV screen, there was just no way. I'd rather just focus all my energy on the things I could do, which was my podcast and starting a second podcast. This was the yep. only time in my entire life that I had eight months off of doing nothing. Uh, yep. You know, I have been running since I hit the ground and to have eight months off, I was like, all right, well, let's focus on stuff I can do. And when it comes back, uh, I'll do it. If it comes back yep. at the time, I didn't even know if it was going to come back for years. Who fucking knows? It was like when nine 11 happened, I was like, well, I don't know if we're ever going to travel again or, or if yeah. there's going to be cyanide in the water or anything. Nobody knows anything. So focus on what you can do, not go crazy, and occasionally write down an idea. Yep. Uh, and I took all those ideas. And then when it started to slowly open back up, I walked on stage and tried the ideas over and over and over. Now I go on about three times a week, which is still not even close to, I was going on for 10 years, three to four times a night. So wow. it's not yeah. even, it's not close. even the yeah. same, but it does feel good to be able to uh, be out with my friends. I miss my friends. I miss, yeah. I miss Bill Burr. You know, I miss yeah. uh, Mark Marin. I miss the comedy store. Yeah. I miss the seller of the stand. I miss, Patrick, who books the the stand going, hey, man, with a fucking big smile and a goddamn, you know, uh, a cheeseburger for me or whatever. I just miss all that, that, the you know, running to the subway yeah. 
And, oh my God, I hope I don't miss this spot. The, all of that. And I've only been doing it 10 years. So I still love it. There's a lot of guys that are 30 years in the game. They're like, whew, all right, all right. I, I can drift away now and it won't look like I quit. You know, yeah. they can blame it on COVID. <laughs> Damn this yeah. COVID, huh? They're like, what do you mean, dude? It's been uh, over for a long time. Oh, 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 <laughs> you know. I think that'll happen to a bunch of people, you know. Well, and, I think there's, yeah. you know. And I don't knock them. I played music 25 years and I get it. You do something. Most people never do anything more than five years. So, to, well, it's the, you know, it's the gym analogy, right? It's, it's what happens when you, when you stop going to the gym, what happens is that time gets filled, that void gets filled with other things. Yep. So then those other things take priority and getting back to the gym is a thousand times harder. So to your point, leaving comedy, I look around, I'm laughing. I'm like, man, I look at all the projects I got done this last year. Oh, yeah. I got a lot of things done at home. I mean, all those times when I was doing something with my family and then I was like, oh shit, I got to go. And I jump in the car. I was here for that for that year doing that. So there's something there that I could see a, a people saying, maybe my life is better. And I think there are a lot of comics whose lives honestly probably would be better. 100%. Saying, focus on your family, focus on these things because you know the deal. Like so much of this is, is obviously talent and the hard work part of it, but there is a, a huge part of this that is just pure luck. It's just lightning in a bottle sometimes. And there are people that sometimes I say, I respect your commitment to this and I respect that you're still doing this, but I also wonder in the back of my mind, is there another version of you? Is there another parallel parallel earth out there where you didn't go into this or maybe you're happier? Right. Um, right. Right. You know, I, 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 I do think that there will be some people that I will not be seeing anymore when the clubs reopen because they just moved on. And maybe that probably is the, is there healthier thing for, for some people Totally, because gave them an excuse to that they couldn't go on stage. So now they're like, Oh, I met a girl. Yeah. You know, I like her, Yeah, you know, yeah. Or, or I had a kid and it's kind of what my, my calling is right now is to be with my kids. So it, it, you don't, you don't realize you, you miss all that stuff. And again, I've been doing it even, you know, half as long as if you have. And then when it disappeared, it's a real nut punch. I mean, the, 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 when I pulled into the parking lot, last week and it was, and there was cars there. I wasn't thinking about the fact that I hadn't been used to seeing no cars for so long. And I saw cars and it jolted me. I was like, what? and I was like, Oh yeah, this is what happens. That energy that you start to feel the minute you get close. And I'm like, there's like this pack tonight. It's going to be fucking packed. And you go in and there's people and there's waitresses going around. Yeah. You, you just miss all, you just miss all, miss all of that and have it taken away like that. So abruptly really, really sucks. And, and hopefully and I think so with everyone getting vaccinated and everything else, I hopefully we're in the clear and uh, this is a distant, distant memory. I want to take those zoom screens. I was talking to telling the owner, you know, we should take the zoom screens and the projectors and fucking shotgun them. Space them in the park. Yeah, just, them. just run them over and every comic just, smash, you know, hits it with a microphone and kicks it and like yeah. never to be used again, never to be used again. Before we get out of here, the silk highway guy, Ross, what's his last name? Ulbrick. Where's he at? How many years did he get? I think he's in Arizona. So Ross is in um, Ross is in federal uh, prison. I think he's in Arizona, if I remember correctly. He got double life plus forty. Double life. Yeah, and that's a and that's a fascinating discussion um, and conversation. And how this all started with with me kind of doing some of these podcasts and whatnot was because a few months ago. Um, Rogan had the director of the Silk Road movie right. on the show. And Alex like Winter nice. did a documentary on it, uh, yeah. Deep Web, yeah. uh, years back. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And just, just a ton of misinformation. He seems like a nice a nice guy, and he, he's talented. I think he did the Night Stalker Netflix thing, which I love. That thing was dark, man. He's awesome. Yeah, and, yeah. and to have the two cops is just unreal. Yeah, yep. It was great. And, and that's really his focus. And I think the problem is, is that so many people have tried to write these movies and these stories about it, but uh, they're, they're unable to get the, the government's version of it, or at least not in a clear way. So you end up with these movies where they focus on these sort of what I consider subplots that were part of the story, but not nearly as relevant um, to what really, really happened. And so when he was on, I started getting all these texts again Hey, check this out. Is this true? Is that true? Were the dirty agents involved? You know, was uh, did he really have an offer of ten years? Did he? Do we really not? Does, does did we? Did he really know he was behind the keyboard the whole time? And the and the director kind of fed into some of these myths about it because he's probably getting the information from family and friends. And I don't. That's fine. You know, I don't expect anything less from the family and friends to kind of spin this yarn about him being set up. 
to me, what's funny is that the story and the and the and the what happened, including the sentence, is a very is very fascinating. The least interesting thing to me about the whole story is a debate on his guilt or innocence. He's absolutely guilty. Um, we and 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 there's a million ways we prove that, and I've gone on a couple of podcasts to kind of explain our case uh, against Ross and how we knew it was Ross the entire time and the scale of it. It was you know 1.2 billion in narcotics uh, sold over a two year period. Wow, the interest and he was yeah. getting a cut on every sale. Yeah, two he he made about 200 million in commission. Is that like a, what was his cut? Three percent or? Uh, 10, uh, 10 oh, shit, I'm thinking 10%, but wow. yeah, I think it was, I know it fluctuated because he fought with a lot of people about that. Cause they would give him a hard time yeah. and he was like, Hey, if you don't fucking like it, scram. Yeah. Um, yeah. but this idea that he created a website and went to jail for creating a website, you know, anytime you read or hear something that sounds contrary to logic, there's probably a, a pretty good explanation as to why that's not true. So when you have dopes going, how are you going to send someone to prison for life for just creating a website? No, if I create a website about, let's say, uh, sports cars and you join and this other guy joins. And then on a private chat, you solicit some murder. Yeah. I'm not responsible for that. I didn't fuck. I created this car site about car to a site about car lovers. Right. You guys went rogue and started doing shit. But when I create a site that does nothing, but let's say murder for hire in this instance, uh, narcotics trafficking, that's what the site was designed to do from day one. It didn't sell bicycle parts and then slowly drifted into this. That's what it was. That to me is where the fascinating debate comes in because argue to me that you don't think selling any type of uh, narcotics should be illegal. I'll, I'll have that debate with you. I'll talk about the pros and cons, the societal implications, the criminal implications. Yeah, there's a good arguments here and there. And we could don't fucking tell me that somebody was set up like, well, if he's your like, you know, your martyr. Well, was he set up or is he a martyr? Like if, if he didn't, if he was set up, then he's just a dope that was, you know, behind the wrong keyboard on the wrong day and he's been framed. But then don't tell me at the same time, he was this forward thinking, you know, libertarian that really understood where, you know, things are going to go. I can't argue both. You, you can't argue both. It's disingenuous, right? It's intellectually dishonest to tell me it's both. He was set up and he was brilliant. So let's talk about what he did, which what we know he did. Let's put aside what you think, what we, you know, your misunderstanding about what we proved. I'm happy to talk to anyone about why we know and how we know. But it seems like I'm usually caught in that debate with people about how we know it was him and how we know he's guilty. And then by the time we get to the interesting things like, so do you think he should have gotten double life? And what are the arguments kind of for and against that? It's like everyone kind of drifts off or we kind of lose, lose time on that on that point. And that's a really interesting discussion. Is there other Silk Highways now? There's got to be. Yeah. So the the Silk Road, when Silk Road went down, um, it was like 13 days later, Silk Road 2 went up. <laughs> and so I was, the, I was the case agent for that. Um, I ended up arresting that guy like a year after that out in San Francisco. They lived like 1.5 miles away from where Ross lived. They didn't know each other. Wow. Just totally wow. bizarre. It's something, I guess, you know, it's something about, uh, you know, San Francisco, who knows. But But yeah, it did open up. We shut that down. It, in, and then a bunch of spinoffs of different sites um, were created. So there's still sites out there that that do this. The, why the case was, why the first one was so special and important was that because it was created on the dark web, it was believed that we could never find him. And if we found him, we'd never be able to prove it. And I think that was the big sort of reason why it was thought to be something impossible. And then we ended up doing it and then ended up you know, convicting him. Did you only get a uh, conviction because his girl snitched? She never snitched. Oh, she didn't? She, we didn't? No, we never even tried to cooperate, uh, Julia. Oh, wow. She, she, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't even think she knew, you know, you could ask my wife about what I do for a living and the answer you get is probably fucking pretty far off of what actually <laughs> <laughs> Something with the computers and uh, yeah. Yeah. he's a hacker or something. And it's like, oh, for Christ's sake. Yeah. So I don't think she really fully understood that the, the, the movie kind of, I, you know, plays into this like she was in the, the ground floor i i honestly don't believe that and plus they were broken up for a while as well um ross did tell a few few people um but the conviction wasn't really based on the cooperators we did flip we did flip uh uh one of his closer friends who he confided in who he he, he confided in that he was in fact running the site he needed help with configuring the site um and showed him how it worked and we did flip that guy and he testified at trial that was very damning because it was the only person really 
uh, during the trial that knew who Ross was in real life and also knew he was Dread Pirate Roberts running the site. So that was a very powerful testimony. But he was convicted because the way Bitcoin works and the way Tor works, which is towards the onion router, it's the dark web. When people say the dark web, they're really talking about Tor. The way that works is all of this stuff that's digital is very, very anonymous until it's not. And what I mean by that is if they don't know who you are, then it's very difficult to figure it out. Once they figure it out, however, by however they figure it out, you're screwed because it's all there in ones and zeros. Um, you know, there's going to be more evidence than we've ever had against an El Chapo in, in the Ross Ulbricht case. He had even on the laptop that was seized that was he was using at the time, like literally using when the laptop was grabbed from him, um, his hands. There was, you know, he was so organized. There was folders like aliases and. Um, you know, he kept spreadsheets on his expenses for like the murder for hires. He would like put in there, like paid for Hitman, wow. you know, $600,000. And he kept a journal. And the journal, uh, what was fascinating about the journal was the journal had details that were a combination of his personal life and his life as Dread Pirate Roberts. So it'd be like today the site got hacked again. Some guy reached out to me and told me that my, my uh, coding sucks. I know he's I know he's being truthful because, you know, I'm figuring this out as I go. You know, I really need to fix this because we can't get hacked again. Period. New paragraph. Went on a date with um, a girl I met on OKCupid named Amelia. Oh. Now, when we go back and we pull OKCupid's records, Ross had an account and went on a date with a girl named Amelia. Oh. So at trial, how do you say that who knows who DPR was, the Dread Pirate Roberts was, when the journal you're keeping is your life? I went to Thailand today. Oh, look what he just posted on Facebook at that time. He went to Thailand. I had a fight with so-and-so. Well, we know he had a fight from this other thing. So all of that stuff was in there and it was just mixed in. And again, he had no street smarts. Right. Um, you know, he was a he was a very uh, intelligent, super, super bright kid. Um, not hi- hyper-technical, by the way, but figured it out. Was bright enough to figure it out. Had to set up a Bitcoin exchange. Had to create a Bitcoin hot wallet. Had to create the escrow system, right? You have people buying drugs. It has to go and escrow the money. The drugs have to be sent. Then the the, the, the buyer has to say, I got it. Then the escrow has to be released. And then he's got to get his percent, right? These aren't easy things to, to, to figure out and also to keep anonymous. What I think people get hung up on is the other things that are probably more interesting about it. Like why, you know, should a person... Who creates a uh, who commits a crime largely online? Should he receive the sentence that someone doing it in real life would receive? Right? I mean, are are you or are, are people more? It still happened in real life. Drugs still went around all over the world, right? People overdosed. People uh, they sold cyanide and poisons that who knows who the fuck that killed. Yeah. But that's why with that with that interview with with um, with the director, it was unfortunate because. There's a lot of people, including Joe, that's really interested in the story, and he's getting like this half version of the story that that you're missing the cool part about this. This isn't about a guy who was set up. This is about a guy who took advantage of technology that that existed for the first time ever, and it grew so big so fast that is there uh, an argument that the punishment maybe is too harsh for somebody like that? It's the future. It's going to be more and more and more of that out there, and... uh... You know, there's going to be a world of just there won't be any street dealers. There won't be any of that. It's just going to be this. There's going to be a dark web type of FedEx company that will be strictly for dropping this shit off. You know, the funny part was, was they turned, you know, the UPS guy and the USPS guy into a fucking drug dealer, which is yeah, hysterical. Totally. They're just cruising with just narcotics and <laughs> fucking and they, cyanide and, you know, bomb making yeah, shit. Yeah. And he's just like delivering stuff, not even, not even realizing. And again, that's another fascinating, you know, uh, part about that was that you're taking advantage of the infrastructure there to, yeah. to have these people. What about the d- argument as to whether it made it, it safer? Um, there's a debate there that that is interesting to me that you're taking, you know, someone going out and having to go to some dark alley to buy it. And now they're buying it based on a vendor rating system. OK, yeah, I can have that debate. Yeah. Well, I don't even know anybody that buys drugs in the dark alley anymore. Yeah. And if they're in the dark the alley, that's just their neighborhood where they pick them up. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. I, I don't see people right. going like, you know, no. dude, I got to head downtown and get some stuff, yeah. you know. But uh, well, fuck, man, it was yeah. great talking to you. 
and uh, yeah, really, really uh, a lot to wrap my brain around. Uh, you know, I've always been interested in Bitcoin, but, uh, you know, I grew up in the 70s with the old pyramid schemes and everything. So it's always kind of like, you know, I, I to me, I still I still hold real estate as king. You know, yeah. uh, it's not invisible. Uh, I own that nope. house over there. There it is. I didn't lose the yep. if I lose the keys. I have a, a, a locksmith a come over keys. and get new <laughs> yeah. keys, you know, but yep. anyway, yep. it's uh, it is good. Um, I think at being 55 years old and constantly learning more and more and more on the yep. Internet of how to work computers and everything keeps you young and in this world and everybody that didn't get into computers 20, 30 years ago yeah. are completely lost now um, yep, at 60 years old. They're just like, I'm, I'm useless. <laughs> and yep. there's no, there's no time like right now to start learning. Anyway, you can learn the internet right now and the, and the web and everything you can, I mean, it's easier than ever to build a website and anything, you know, with Squarespace and Wix and all that stuff. So it does seem confusing and scary. But if you just get somebody like you that explains a, a, a corner of it, then you start to learn it. Right. And, uh, and I hope to see you, man, out in New York. I'll be yeah. out there hopefully in a couple months uh, doing a lot of comedy and I hope to uh, meet you in person. Yeah, for sure. Let let me know, and uh, you know we'll, we'll exchange contact information. I definitely uh, like to set that up. That'd be great, and uh, we'll talk some more Bitcoin. I'm always down for it. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Tell, you, got uh, you got an Instagram or anything? Uh, you could just uh, go to my Twitter uh, at Proof of Work One. Uh, someone has Proof of Work Non One, so at Proof of Work One, um, hit me up on Twitter. What about um, your your work? If people need you for cyber stuff. Uh, yeah, they can find me. I usually try to keep that kind of separate, believe it or okay, not. Okay, I you get could, it. You could, it. You, you could find me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, okay. hit me up on that. That's fine. You got it. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for doing the show and uh, got it. have a fantastic weekend. You too. Take I'll care. I'll see dude. you, man. See you. Bye.